<laughs> in a mana, in a reo, in a karangatanga maha, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. In a rangatira, kiora koto, no my hari maiki tene fare, no my hari maiki tene hui hunya. It's wonderful to see you all here tonight. Um, my name is Mark Barrow, I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Education and Social Work, and it's great to welcome you all here to, um, this evening, particularly to acknowledge Deirdre and her inaugural lecture. My job here at this point is just to say welcome and to pass you over to Mark Tessa, the Head of the School of Learning Development and Professional Practice. Kia ora, Mark, thank you. Um, kia ora koutou and uh, welcome, and it's my, as the Head of School of uh, of the learning development and professional practice, it's my great pleasure and privilege to, to introduce uh, Professor Deidre Lefebvre. It's a very special event for any kind of school when they introduce a new professor. It's very exciting and, uh, and I'm really looking forward together with you to, to listening to Deidre's talk tonight and which will fully um, welcome her to the professoriate. Um, and today when Deidre and I talked, we actually reflected how special this moment is. And uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you coming here and joining this celebration. Um, Deidre's research, as we all know, is in educational leadership. But um, it's not only what Deidre's research is, it's actually what Deidre does and performs in her daily academic and professional life. She's an um, educational leader, and uh, we are very lucky to have her in in our school. Um, Deidre has been a lecturer in, um, at the faculty since uh, 1995, which is, uh, and um, which sort of followed her, her time offshore then um, in uh, Washington and Michigan, where she gained her PhD. And uh, she's a fabulous scholar and uh, who published over 60 books and uh, research articles and, com and completed over 30 postgraduate supervisions. I mean, your track record is just absolutely amazing. And uh, that was really important for me because we shared the floor and I see students coming in and out of your office. And rarely I see uh, students who speak so highly of their supervisor, of their staff and of the relationship that they have with you. And that's very special. Um, one of the things that um, Deidre really does is she's a leader of an academic program and she's a leader of a uh, I mean, you've been leader since 2005, I think, so for such a long time, and you, but what you've achieved in the time in the program of educational leadership is really transformative. You have transformed the whole our offerings in educational leadership, um, created the online offering of Auckland Online, and uh, which has really created a new space and uh, a new opportunity for a lot of uh, our school leaders to be able to complete this degree with us and opportunity to really lead a lot of other staff members who are part of um, uh, educational leadership of our educational leadership group of our school. Um, Deidre also works across the faculties and, uh, and where she's utilizing her leadership work and more recently doing absolutely fascinating work in nursing and uh, which we are looking forward to hearing more about and um, was able to but, but, but one of the things that, as a head of school, I really admire about Deidre is her service and leadership. That means supporting other scholars, um, building community, research culture, and collaboration around area of educational leadership. Um, one of the things that, um, that, that, we, <laughs> that, we, that we all really acknowledge about Deidre is the mentoring and the way she mentors her colleagues and her students, and, but also the mentoring that you do across internationally that you've done. That's been um, extremely powerful. And I personally met the very first time when, when you were leading the narrative and metaphor uh, group uh, together with Sandy Farqua and Esther Fitzpatrick. And it's been just, I was just a PhD student. It was just unbelievable how, how welcoming and supportive you were of, of young scholars coming into the field. And I think that's sort of what remained. And that's what I think also being a professor means to be really accepting and welcoming um, new scholars to the field. Apart from all these kind of areas of Deidre being an amazing academic leader and academic scholar, Deidre is an amazing human being. She's, she's hardworking and diligent and passionate and shows always positivity and perseverance and uh, her ability to listen and to collaborate and to show empathy and patience to others, always kind and generous to, to help other, her team, her colleagues, her students. Um, there is something, um, despite all these um, amazing academic credentials that Deidre um, has, 
there is something also very special about uh, her work that sort of really goes across fields and disciplines and areas. And I think the audience here tonight is very clear that the people came from, from all around different disciplines and fields and areas of your life. And with that, I just have to say, welcome, Debrie, and please come in. And we are looking forward to listening to your talk, Professor Atog, on leadership, learning, and change. Here we are. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome and introduction. Kia ora koutou. You're all my special people. You're my family and friends and past students and current students and colleagues. And actually, you don't know this, but on Zoom, there are many people. Um, there are family and friends from other parts of New Zealand. There are colleagues in Germany and across the US. And I can't um, thank them enough for getting up at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> for some of them, it's almost midnight. and It will be past midnight by the time we finish. And so if you see me looking down here, it's because I'm looking at my other colleagues and family and friends. So thank you. So today I plan to do three things. I am going to talk a little bit about what's influenced my life and my academic journey. I'm going to talk about some ideas I've explored over the years in research, teaching, and service. And I'm going to leave you with a few questions at the end. So it's my first day of school, and I'm all keen and eager. People have been asking when I'm going to start school for as long as I can remember. I've got a new coat, and clearly my mum has too. And a very smart little suitcase with my sandwiches in them. I remember liking primary school as a young child, and these were the 1970s. My favourite day of primary school was actually lamb and calf day. So on lamb and calf day, we got to take our pet lamb or calf to school. I lived in Carterton on the right of the upper, and many of the community were farmers. Our family were not farmers. But I still remember my father staying up well into the night with a bottle feeding these tiny wee lambs when they were just days old. I think I had more pride in winning the best tamed lamb, which meant when you called it, it came and it followed you around. <laughs> than for being good at writing or best at doing timetables. It was the really special part of life at primary school. I did well at primary school and again showed at intermediate school when we moved to Fiori. And then I went to high school. And I want you to remember what Marek's just said about my hard work and my commitment. Just please remember that because by the time I got to high school, things were a little different. My trajectory through schooling was about to take a really sharp nosedive and continue pretty much through to the end of high school. I'd have to say they weren't the years I got to shine at school, but interestingly, they were the years that I got to shine outside of school. I was a Queen's Guide, I did my Gold Duke of Edinburgh, I did lots of community service and outdoor pursuits. So school and I were not a good match. I do want to say that this was the 1980s, and this is nothing about the school today. It has a different name, and it's a completely different school. Just put that out there. <laughs> um, but this is my fifth form year, year 11, and these are my results. So achievement. I think you'd have to say a solid C student. <laughs> Initiative, average. And industry, average. And fortunately, I was courteous, though I'm not actually so sure this is true, because if you look on the right-hand side, the very bottom line, geography, it says homework often not done can be cheeky if reprimanded. <laughs> and I well remember the day my mother, my poor mother, was hauled into the, well, she, no, she wasn't, I was the one that was hauled in. She went to see the principal to say, this isn't right, this isn't fair, what's going on? And the principal was a smart man and he hauled me out of class and said, is this right? And I had to drop my head and say, yes, it was. And my poor mother had to sit there. Clearly school wasn't a good match for me. I left high school at the end of my seventh form with a letter from the school career advisor stating that he strongly advised me not to attend university and that, I quote, I wasn't university material. <laughs> I went anyway. Oh. 
Well, it's 1983 and I'm off to Palmerston North Teachers College, complete with mullet, <laughs> to become a primary school teacher. I entered Teachers College with a different perspective to most of my colleagues, my colleagues, my peers who had done my at school, liked education, thought schooling was good. I can remember entering Teachers College with one big question, and I really did. I'm not making this up while I stand here. How can I make schools better? That's what I wanted to do. School had failed me. Um, I got through because of the things I did outside of school. So it didn't always make me popular with the placement teachers when we went into schools because I was not interested in the status quo. I wanted to change things right back from then. And sometimes they would fail me because I wouldn't teach the way I was supposed to. I wanted to do it differently. It was a pretty rocky road through teachers' college. But what it gave me, which has stayed with me until today, is a determination to support those who are not succeeding for whatever reasons, and that hasn't ever left me. Fortunately, I began my teacher education at Palmerston North Teachers College at the same time as when we began to do a Bachelor of Education concurrently. And that's when I really realised that education could change, that education could be empowering, and that there was a place for me. So I remember having to write an assignment about how policy helps make schooling better. And I wrote one on how policy doesn't make schooling better. And I still got an A+. Plus. So that was when I realised that critique was valuable, that I could be valued, and that we must fight for change. My first teaching position was to be at Ranui Primary School. Can't see with these lights very well. Thank you up there. So Peter and Jenny and Karen from 1987, my first years at Runaway Primary School are here tonight. And this was a very formative time for me. It was a period in education when teachers had a lot of control over pedagogy, over curriculum, over freedom. I remember Friday mornings, pretty much, we'd put plastic all over the floor and we'd paint for the whole morning and all of the cultural treasures and the language and the science and all the things that came out of that were so rich. I was very fortunate to start teaching at a time when teachers' professionalism was really respected and it was, it was just on the eve of tomorrow's schools. I was also very fortunate that I was mentored at this time by Peter Kaiser, who's sitting up there in a green shirt, in case you don't know who he is. And at that time, he was a relatively young teacher. And instead of mentoring me on how to fill out all the paperwork or the little blue book we used to have, we would talk and talk and talk about big philosophical conversations around education, what it meant, how to make schools better, how to serve students who were underrepresented, underserved. And that put me in a really good place um, to really want to stay in education. So thank you. Like many young people, I left New Zealand to do my big OE. And I, this included teaching in, in parts of London that had intense economic poverty. And I remember walking into a class one day and the principal said, all I want you to do is stay till three o'clock. And I walked into the class and I thought, I'm not sure this is going to work actually. Um, but I stayed till three o'clock because I'd had a different teacher every single day since the beginning of the year. And then I went back the next day and the next day, and I'm probably almost going to cry, and the next day. And they tried to make me cry, but once they realised, even if I did cry, I was still going back. They gave up. Um, so those were pretty formative times for me in my education. That's when I learned how important youth voice is and how we can never take for granted that we know what's best for another young person. So just in contrast... I then went to Godham County Middle School. So I'd just been at a school where the children didn't have shoes. And then I came to this school. And I remember the day when the principal called me into the office and he said, look out the window. And all my class were running around with no shoes on. And this was not a school where you take your school, your shoes off. This was a very posh school. And then we both looked at my feet and I didn't have any shoes on. <laughs> And admittedly, I'd just been climbing on a chair, putting up artwork. You can see there's a bit of a theme from my teaching days that art was an important curriculum area for me. But it was a very key thing to do, and the students had decided that they were going to do what I did. And that was a time when I actually realised how important teachers were, and that actually they'd all taken their shoes off, but they were probably doing a whole lot of other things as well. 
So it was quite a silly story, but a significant time. Looking back, it's probably no surprise that I was to become a teacher because my grandmother, Olive, was a teacher in 1915. And this is a photo of her at the time. At, she was a teacher at Cobden School. This is actually Greymouth School just down the road. But it gives us a picture of what education was like at that time. Not only was my grandmother a teacher, my mother, my older sister, and I were all to be teachers at some periods in our lives. I think maybe it was the matching dresses. <laughs> but let's go back to the time my mother was a teacher. So I'm going to share a short video, it's just a minute, and I think it provides some insights into what the world was like when my mother was a teacher in the 1950s. You'll notice that I explain in this who Jacinda Ardern is, and that's because it's a clip taken out of a longer film that I made when I was doing a course at the New York Film Academy last year. So I had to explain to the people in the US who, well, I didn't actually, as it turned out, but who Jacinda Ardern was. So I'm going to show this clip, hopefully. She moved to university and trained as a teacher and a speech language therapist. My mother met my father when they were both at university. They married in 1957. My mother stopped paid employment the day she was married. It was expected. She had become a housewife. I'm walking outside my house. It's a 1950s house, built for the housewives of the 50s and their families. But now it's 2021. I walk into my lounge. Jacinda Ardern is talking. She's our Prime Minister and first became Prime Minister when she was 38 years old. Some days this still jolts me. How could the world have changed so much since my mother was a young woman? Friction stay windows in the living room bring in plenty of sun, while from the kitchen sink, the housewife keeps up with affairs in the neighbourhood. <laughs> Here's a space saver. A drop table hides the stools. An ideal breakfast table for two. <laughs> Looking through the slide across the living room to the street, Mrs. Housewife keeps up with the events of the rest of the night. <laughs> what do we do here to get back to the next slide? Oh, excellent. Uh, great. Um, so why do I show this? Well, first of all, Mrs. Housewife is from the New Zealand Film Archives, and it still jolts me to be reminded how much the world has changed since my mother was a teacher. But actually, it also still jolts me to realise how much the world still needs to change since my mother was a teacher. There was a bit of nervous laughter as well as laughter watching that one. I also show it because I've been interested throughout my career in the power of video to portray and explore ideas. So after completing my master's and working as an assistant lecturer here at the University of Auckland, I headed off to the United States to do my PhD at the University of Michigan. I was invited to be a researcher on the third international mathematics science study, TIMS, and I was an interesting choice given I wasn't really very good at math and I wasn't really very good at science. But what I was good at was analysing, learning and teaching and analysing practice. And we spent literally years studying classroom teaching videos from the Czech Republic, from Hong Kong, the Netherlands, Switzerland, the United States, Australia, Japan and lots of other countries. And video provided a really powerful tool for interrogating pedagogy. So my research, um, my PhD went on to focus on video as a pedagogical tool on how video records of practice could be used to improve learning and teaching. And again, I spent hours analysing video, this time exploring how people can learn by watching video of their own practice to improve. So it was 25 years since I began my PhD research. Um, back then, the great excitement was that we could do non-linear analysis because we had DVDs. We didn't have VHS tapes anymore. Uh, that was great excitement. Uh, so clearly some things have come a really long way, uh, but some things have stayed the same. So the power of narrative, the power of visual images to make sense of our lives through story, um, that has remained. So this is a picture of the University of Michigan, obviously. 
and it drew people from all over the world. And on Zoom right now, we've got Marnie and Kathy and Andra and Kathy and Doris, um, who are all over the world now, but who were my teachers and peers when I was in Michigan. So I want to thank them for their support there and their support in the years all the way up to now. The University of Michigan was a place that was, was rich, actually. It was very rich in people, and it was very rich in resources. So you could take part in many, many different research projects, and I did. And I made it my business to engage in as many different methodologies as I could at that time. And what I learned was that these big, long, ongoing debates about which is better, quantitative or qualitative, they were fruitless. They really are, and I still believe they're fruitless because it all the value is when it all brings together the big picture. A particularly powerful research experience I remember, and my colleague Tamara, who's on Zoom there will remember, was when we worked with a colleague focusing on those who were experiencing extreme economic poverty in Oregon, they were homeless people. And this is when my real involvement in arts-based research began. So the research focused on understanding the lived experience of homeless people. And as researchers, we performed a play, we acted in a play that we created from the transcripts of the interviews with those people. But the most powerful part was that when we performed it, they came and they watched and they said what we had done right and what we had done wrong and they spoke. And this community that is so often underserved and doesn't have a voice was given a voice in the study. And I think for me, that's remained arts-based qualitative research at its best. So what I didn't say was uh, that that was Washington State, did I? So I've missed a big piece. So I'll just go back. So from, from Michigan, I went to Washington State University as an assistant professor. And actually, the main things I wanted to say about this is um, that was if you're out my office window on the left. I took that photo. Not bad, was it? <laughs> And again, I kept doing more research um, on video. So it was a really, really beautiful place to live and to work. So after nearly 10 years in the States, I returned home to Auckland and it was like a cycle completed. I returned home to the University of Auckland, to the people who had supported and prepared me on the way. People like Ian Wilkinson, who had mentored me through my master's and is on Zoom, but maybe I should be looking that way rather than at the computer. Uh, people like Julia Westra, who is here tonight somewhere. Thank you, Julia. And Stuart McNaughton. And those were the years uh, when I started with Helen Dixon and Alison Jones, Alison Hoare, Helen Timpoli, Judy Parr. And we taught here, they supported me, and I returned to then be able to mentor others. Back in New Zealand, my son Eli was born. Eli perhaps understands better than anyone else what's involved in working here. Today, today he's a young man about to do his final year at secondary school, and I might add he's been somewhat more successful at secondary school mm -hmm. than I was. And he continually supports me, asks me questions, gives me the student perspective, and helps me with my technological challenges. <laughs> He understands from the inside what my work entails, and he has for a long time. In this picture, we're both trying to write. He's still a kindy kid, and he sort of gets the angst of writing, I feel, from that picture. So way back then, here's another picture from that time. <laughs> and perhaps most importantly, Eli understands what it takes to teach really, really big graduate courses here in the faculty. And if you don't happen to know, and I know a lot of you do, Megan included, is it takes a lot of marking, a huge amount of marking. And this photo was taken one day when I walked into my room and Eli was sitting at the computer. And I said, oh, what should we do this morning, Eli? Sorry, Beg, can't talk now. I'm marking. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the big questions that have guided and continue to guide my work in academia? How do people learn? What makes a good leader? Why is it challenging to bring about change? How can organisations improve? And what methods are powerful in researching these questions? When I look at research, across my research over the years, they keep reappearing. They never really go away, these questions. The idea of continuing to try to address the same questions, however, puts me in very good company. 
Albert Einstein, so the story goes, was handing out exam papers when one of his students challenged him. Are these are the same as questions as last year, the student explained. Yes, replied Einstein, they are the same questions, but the answers will be different this year. So whether or not this story is accurate or not, um, I don't know, but it's been reported. But questions such as how can we change the ways that we work to be supportive of our most vulnerable learners? What leadership practices promote equity? And what is the most effective approach to professional learning to create improvement in an organisation? These questions persist. They never go away. They probably never will go away. But the ways we need to respond to them are complex and changing. So I've been interested in these questions across the professions. For example, my researchers examine professional leadership and learning in schools, in medical education for anaesthetists, across high performance sport, and currently within the nursing profession. And these same questions have guided my work across diverse countries. I was thinking back when I was writing this talk about just the last 12 months alone. And in the last 12 months alone, I've had the privilege to collaborate with researchers, professional developers, educational leaders, teachers, graduate students from this range of countries. And what that means for me is there's so much to learn with and from others. So I'm gonna make a disclaimer now, because what I'm gonna talk about next uh, it's just a couple of ideas from my research, and they aren't earth shattering, and they're probably not new to you. But what they are is they're really important in organisations and change, and they're really, really hard to do. I don't mean to research, I mean to actually make happen. So my work continues to focus on how we can do this well, how we can get beyond pockets of excellence and improvement, and towards systemic and sustaining improvement across our organisations, in particular, our schools. <coughs> so if I had to put it into just a few words, my key focus continues to be on leadership matters, effective leaders understand change, and are they able to lead effective change processes? From the day I began my PhD at the University of Michigan, I was told to go narrow, to be focused, to be successful as an academic, you had to have a specific field and follow it. But did I take that advice? No, not at all. So I'm not an educational psychologist or an educational sociologist or a historian or a critical theorist. I'm not really anything. But what I am is I draw on all these different theories and approaches into my work. And that's what I found really valuable. So leaders today face significant, complex and ongoing problems which demand they lead in spaces where disagreement, uncertainty and ambiguity often prevail. The French philosopher Renaud once said, "There's no certainty. There are only people who are certain." The problems that leaders have to address and the uncertainty in the context they work in sometimes seem tougher than ever. Today's world has been described as volatile, uncertain, and complex. Leadership matters, matters more than ever, and leaders who understand how to navigate through complexity can have a powerful impact. One of the biggest challenges in leadership is the temptation to want to solve problems quickly. Much of my recent work has focused on the concept of adaptive leadership. This work has proven to be powerful in schools here and overseas, and it's lovely to see some of you from the schools that I've actually been working in on adaptive leadership. I also want to acknowledge Fiona L, somewhere here, and Helen Timperley and Kate Wyford um, for their work in this area. So I'm not sure um, how well you can read this. Maybe you can take a quick scan. But I draw heavily on the work of Heifetz and colleagues from Harvard. And here we see the difference between routine challenges and complex challenges. Most of the challenges educational leaders face are complex challenges. But one of the main problems is it's human nature to treat problems as routine challenges. So there's a tendency to try to solve complex problems with simple solutions, 
And it's one of the major pitfalls of leadership across sectors. So solving complex challenges demands adaptive leadership. And adaptive leadership requires us to think differently, but we're not very good at it. And if you don't believe me, let's have a go at it in a moment. So I'm going to give you a minute to try and solve this problem. And we know from research on problem solving that collaborative problem solving is better than sitting there by yourself staring at it. So if you want to talk to other people, you can. But if you're one of those people who've already seen this and I know who you are, um, don't tell the people around you just at the moment what the solution is. I can see a bit of us going on. Okay, so how many people who haven't seen it before have figured it out? Okay, uh, four, maybe. <laughs> So why do we find it difficult? It's obvious now, right? We become stuck in our existing ways of seeing, seeing things. We can't see this as anything other than a Roman numeral. Our existing schema frames, and it's challenging to get beyond it. And it's the same in leadership. We continue to draw on the same ways of doing things, the same ways of seeing things, even when they're not working. So effective leaders understand that some problems can't be easily solved and that existing ways of working and existing theories and beliefs won't serve us into the future. Michael Fulham once said, we learn most from those with whom we disagree, but we tend to associate with and listen most to those with whom we do agree. So if you add this to the challenge of getting beyond our existing frames, our tendency to engage with new information that confirms our pre-existing convictions becomes clear why leaders have such a difficult job in bringing about change. So now I want to talk a little bit about an idea that can help us get beyond our existing ways of doing things. It's pretty common knowledge for those of us who work in education that inquiry is a good thing. There are shelves and shelves of books and chapters and papers about inquiry. So inquiry is about taking a stance of wanting to learn, to find out, to check assumptions, test hypotheses, to learn to improve. But my question was, when it actually comes down to it, how much inquiry is actually genuine? Again, quick list of what genuine inquiry means. Seeking to understand others' perspectives, holding a stance of curiosity, wondering, trying to understand rather than to explain open-mindedness, a willingness to consider your own views in the face of new information. Sounds like attributes most of us would like to have. Well, how much inquiry when we do research is actually genuine? Not much. It's a bit of a rough pie graph, but it represents how much is genuine. So I did this research with school leaders across New Zealand. But if you're not a school leader, don't be sitting there thinking, well, that's about school leaders like those ones over there. This is not about me, um, because actually it's about all of us. And Argus and Schoen and Harvard have done this research with tens of thousands of people and found that we are not good at inquiring. We're very good at advocating, saying what we believe, saying what we think, especially educators, sorry, particularly good at it, but we're not good at inquiring. So in my research, I've identified two main patterns that happen rather than genuine inquiry. So mostly we engage inquiry that's manipulative um, or testing. So let's look a bit closer at what these mean. Inquiry that's manipulative is when you appear to ask a question, but really you're making a statement or request. So when I say to Eli, do you think the lawns need mowing? I'm not interested in his judgment about vegetation and growth. I'm saying... I would like you to mow the lawns today. <laughs> the other common type of inquiry is testing. And that's when we ask a question to which we already know the answer, 
or at least we think we know the answer. There's no curiosity, there's no open mindedness. <laughs> there's a right answer, and I'm fishing for it. So, general inquiry, on the other hand, is when we really want to understand another perspective, we're willing to learn, even when it's uncomfortable, and most important, we're willing to change our own views and practices based on what we've learned. Understanding what genuine inquiry means and engaging in the leader is a small idea, but it can have a big impact on leading change. And another idea I've done a lot of research on recently is, again, it's not earth-shattering, it's not a big idea, but it's been ignored for too long, and that's the role of emotion in change. So my research and teaching focuses on how to bring about systemic and sustained change for improvement. Too often a new idea or initiative is developed, perhaps actually a really good one, well thought through with good intentions, but it fails. And often it fails because we haven't thought well enough about the process of change and implementation. This is common at a classroom level, at a school level, at a national policy level, and I studied it at all these different levels. Often we ignore the role of emotion in change. We don't pay attention to how people actually feel about the change. So it's astounding how little attention is paid to this. And my interest in the role of risk in education began in Detroit, Michigan, and it's still part of my research today. When people are involved in change, there's emotion involved. One common emotion is a perception of risk. So a perception of risk is when you have the sense that what you have to lose outweighs what you have to gain. And this causes people to be reluctant to engage in change. Maybe the perception of risk is that they'll lose their sense of competence or control over their time or that they'll have to give up working in a way that they like working. And perceptions of risk are different for different people. So this is a photo taken in Arbor, Michigan, just down the road from where I lived in the middle of winter. And on the first day of winter, and there's other people who've lived in places like this um, who will remember this, the first day of winter, when the snow comes, the young kids go whooping outside because probably it's a school, this is no, no school day, a snow day they would call it, because they need to plow the roads and they get to ski and play in the snow and have a great time. On that very same day, the older adults in the community will look out the window and they'll have a sense of perception of risk and fear because they're worried to walk to the mailbox, they might fall, they might break their hip. They're worried that their family and friends now will find it difficult to come and visit and they'll be isolated. So it's the same in educational change. A new initiative can be welcomed by some and not by others for very different but valid reasons. And my research has shown that when leaders talk about the role of emotion and understand the perceptions of risk that others might be feeling, it opens the door to actually talking about change processes. So it enables us to rethink what resistance means, that maybe it's more than people just not engaging. Maybe there are complex reasons and emotions involved. And it's actually only by understanding those that we can really bring about successful change. So I've just spoken about a couple of ideas here. Um, they're really about change knowledge, about the sorts of understandings that can have a powerful effect on how people lead. And I've chosen them to focus on small ideas because they can have a big impact, an impact in education and beyond. So here are some questions for you to consider. When we think about genuine inquiry, you might ask yourself, what motivates me to be curious? How do I respond to information that doesn't align with my thinking and actions? How do I deal with ambiguity and uncertainty? And when we think about emotion, we might think about these key questions. What might others perceive as a risk in this situation? How can I check? And how can I respond? 
And I might add, in doing this work and research for so many years, I actually never use the words perceptions of risk in my work. It's part of my research, it's part of my theory, but I don't go and say, so what are your perceptions of risk in this situation? You know, it's about conversations and trying to understand the experiences of others. So those of you who know my teaching, we know that this is something I often do. When I talk about effective leadership of change, I often talk about the importance of considering what we need to stop doing, what we need to start doing, and what we should keep doing. So first was the stop. Carl Reich has spent years studying the learning and behaviours of firefighters in the USA. These are the people who fight fires that take out huge forests, that take out whole communities and towns, and that go on for weeks. And these firefighters are trained to carry huge loads of equipment that weigh them down, their tools. These are the tools they use to fight fires, and they're also the tools that keep them alive. But he studied them because they were dying. They were dying doing the work they were so highly trained to do because they didn't drop their tools when they needed to. There's a point of time in this firefighting when you have to drop your tools and run, but they didn't. They died because they held on to the tools for too long and they were too heavy and they couldn't run away. So in education, we tend to hold on to tools too. Maybe they don't have such a dramatic and seeable impact, but they do in the long haul, they do over time. So the beliefs and ways of doing things that no longer serve us, we need to get rid of them. There are some things that we need to stop. Start is already there. What do we need to begin doing? How can we enable ourselves and others to think beyond our current frames and reasoning so that we can solve complex, ambiguous and uncertain problems of today and the future? Because the fact of the matter is they're here, they're with us, and some days they feel like they're getting more and bigger every day. And there's a lot we can do. And then keep. There are some things we do well. We should keep doing these things. Change for change's sake isn't helpful. Change to improve valued outcomes, that's what we need. So as the saying goes, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. It's important that we can identify what's working well, what we should hold on to, and what we should keep. So much has changed in education and society since my grandmother was a teacher in Greymouth in 1915. My mother was a teacher in the 50s, and Mrs. Housewife was expected to stop work, put the tray table away, and look out the kitchen window at the neighbourhood. The idea in my research about change, the ideas in my research about change aren't hard to understand. They are, however, complex and hard to implement. And that's why I felt so privileged to be able to create an academic career that authentically combines teaching, professional development in schools, research and service in ways that make these ideas come alive. For that, I'd like to thank the young people, teachers and leaders in the schools I've worked, you, my colleagues and friends, including our leadership, research, teaching team who are scattered around, um, Kate Twyford, Chris Inema, Fraka Meyer, Megan Walton, Joe Smith. Thank you to Mark and Merrick for your support. And thank you to my mentors over the years. In particular, I want to thank Ian Wilkinson, and I'll look that way instead of that way. Lorna Earl, somewhere. Thank you, Lorna. Christine Ruby Davies, who's on Zoom. And Helen Timperley, Vivian Robinson, and Richard Hamilton, who couldn't be here. They've mentored and supported me over the years, as have many others of you. So thank you. Finally, I want to thank my family, Eli, Morris, who's on Zoom, Alison, Sandy, Rebecca, who's on Zoom, Jimmy, and Jack, who's on Zoom. And I want to thank my sister, Philippa, who's been my constant mentor, friend, and cheerleader since the day I failed my high school fifth form year, <laughs> back in 1979. So thank you.
Kia ora koutou. Um, kia ora, kia ora anō. Um, it's my um, job at this point of the evening to thank um, Deidre for her very inspiring address. And if um, at this point you sort of meant to think about some of the things that Deidre said and um, think about yourself and that, and as a leader in the faculty, I'm now just completely terrified and I'm not going to do that because this is <laughs> probably not the place to make myself look vulnerable um, this evening. <laughs> But it is my great pleasure to thank you, Deidre, for, for what was an inspiring and interesting and challenging inaugural address. Promotion to professor is the highest accolade that a university can bestow, can bestow on, its academic, on an academic staff member. And to promote an academic to this rank, the university enacts an exhaustive review of her work to be assured of the excellence of her teaching, research and service. The rigorous, rigorous process that Professor Lefebvre's promotion of her promotion ended here this evening with his inauguration. Inaugurations of professors and the rituals associated with them are, are a tradition that stretches back to the very beginnings of the medieval university. In the past, almost all the rituals involved the new professor paying for large doses of hospitality for his, and I use the pronoun advisedly, new colleagues, in some cases with, with feasting extending for several days or weeks. <laughs> somewhere, somewhere along the way, the requirement that the new professor provide food and drink for the university staff has been lost, and I'm sure Deirdre is grateful for that. <laughs> However, what has survived is the ritual of the inaugural lecture. Thus, this evening, we have participated in an event with a lot, very long history and, association with the West, and associated with the Western University since its very inception. I'm sure you will all agree with me that this evening, Professor Lefebvre has played her, well, role, her, well, her role well in preserving the tradition of the inaugural lecture. She has provided us with ample evidence of her academic prowess and her worthiness to be accorded the rank of Professor. Congratulations, Deirdre. I ask you all to join with me once more in congratulating and thanking Professor Lefebvre. Okay.